Let me start now. <clears throat> Let me get, let me get Ready. Okay, that probably picked up. So that was somebody in the condo complex, which we live at, which I'm not going to reveal where it is. You have to imagine where we live. Okay, this is continuing J.J.'s popular literature. This is George Orwell's 1984, the copy published by Signet Classics. So if you have that one and you're following along, we're going to go for 18 pages tonight. We're going to start at 63 and go to 81. The first chapter is very short. It's only six pages, and the next one is long. It's 12 pages, so I'm going to try to do the whole thing. Roman numeral 6, on page 63. Winston was writing in his diary. It was three years ago. It was on a dark evening in a narrow side street near one of the big railway stations. She was standing near a doorway in the wall, under a street lamp that hardly gave any light. She had a young face painted very thick. It was really the paint that appealed to me, the whiteness of it, like a mask, and the bright red lips. Party women never paint their faces. There was nobody else in the street, and no telescreens. She said two dollars. I. For the moment, it was too difficult to go on. He shut his eyes and pressed his fingers against them, trying to squeeze out the vision that kept recurring. He had an almost overwhelming temptation to shout a string of filthy words at the top of his voice, or to bang his head against the wall to kick over the table and hurl the ink pot through the window. To do any violent or noisy or painful thing that might black out the memory that was tormenting him. Your worst enemy, he reflected, was your own nervous system. At any moment, the tension inside you was liable to translate itself into some visible symptom. He thought of a man whom he had passed in the street a few weeks back, a quite ordinary-looking man, a party member, aged 35 or 40, tallish and thin, carrying a briefcase. They were a few meters apart when the left side of the man's face was suddenly contorted by a sort of spasm. It happened again just as they were passing one another. It was only a twitch, a quiver rapid as the clicking of a camera shutter, but obviously habitual. He remembered thinking at the time, that poor devil is done for. And what was frightening was that the action was quite possibly unconscious. The most deadly danger of all was talking in your sleep. There was no way of guarding against that so far as he could see. He drew in his breath and went on writing. I went with her through the doorway and across a backyard into a basement kitchen. There was a bed against a wall and a lamp on the table turned down very low. She, his teeth were set on edge. He, he would have liked to spit. Simultaneously with a woman in the basement kitchen, he thought of Catherine, his wife. Winston was married, had been married at any rate. Probably he still was married, for so far as he knew, his wife was not dead. He seemed to breathe against the warm, stuffy odor of the basement kitchen, an odor compounded of bugs and dirty clothes and villainous cheap scent but nevertheless alluring, because no woman of the party ever used scent, or could be imagined as doing so. Only the proles used scent. In his mind, the smell of it was inextricably mixed up with fornication. When he had gone with that woman, it had been his first lapse in two years or thereabouts. Consorting with prostitutes was forbidden, of course, but it was one of those rules that you could occasionally nerve yourself to break. It was dangerous, but it was not a life-and-death matter. To be caught with a prostitute might mean five years in a forced labor camp, not more if you had committed no other offense. And it was easy enough provided that you could avoid being caught in the act. The poorer quarters swarmed with women who were ready to sell themselves. Some could even be purchased for a bottle of gin, which the proles were not supposed to drink. Tacitly, the party was even inclined to encourage prostitution as an outlet for instincts which could not be altogether suppressed. Mere debauchery did not matter very much so long as it was furtive and joyless and only involved the women of a submerged and despised class. The unforgivable crime was promiscuity between party members. But, though this was one of the crimes that the accused in the Great Purges invariably confessed to, it was difficult to imagine any such thing actually happening. The aim of the party was not merely to prevent men and women from forming loyalties which, might, which it might not be able to control. Its real undeclared purpose was to remove all pleasure from the sexual act. Not love so much as eroticism was the enemy, inside marriage as well as outside of it. All marriages between party members had to be approved by a committee appointed for the purpose, and, though the principle was never clearly stated, permission was always refused if the couple concerned gave the impression of being physically attracted to one another. The only recognized purpose of marriage was to beget children for the service of the party. 
Sexual intercourse was to be looked on as a slightly disgusting minor operation, like having an enema. This again was never put into plain words, but in an indirect way it was rubbed into every party member from childhood onwards. <clears throat> there were even organizations such as the Junior Anti-Sex League, which advocated complete celibacy for both sexes. All children were to be... Pink pages are sticking together... All children were to be begotten by artificial insemination, art sem it was called in Newspeak, and brought up in public institutions. This, Winston was aware, was not meant altogether seriously, but somehow it fitted in with the general ideology of the party. <clears throat> the party was trying to kill the sex instinct, or if it could not be killed, then to distort it and dirty it. He did not know why this was so, but it seemed natural that it should be so. And so far as the women were concerned, the party's efforts were largely successful. He thought again of Catherine. It must be nine, ten, nearly eleven years since they had parted. It was curious how seldom he thought of her. For days at a time, he was capable of forgetting that he had ever been married. They had only been together for about fifteen months. The party did not permit divorce, but it rather encouraged separation in cases where there were no children. Catherine was a tall, fair-haired girl, very straight, with splendid movements. She had a bold, aquiline face, a face that one might have called noble until one discovered that there was nearly, as possible, nothing behind it. Very early in their married life, he had decided, though perhaps it was only that he knew her more intimately than he knew most people, that she had, without exception, the most stupid, vulgar, empty mind that he had ever encountered. She had not a thought in her head that was not a slogan, and there was no imbecility, absolutely none, that she was not capable of swallowing if the party handed it out to her. The, the quote, the human soundtrack, he nicknamed her in his own mind. Yet he could have endured living with her if it had not been for just one thing, sex. As soon as he touched her, she seemed to wince and stiffen. To embrace her was like embracing a jointed wooden image, and what was strange was that even she was clasping him against her, head, her, against her, he had the feeling that she was simultaneously pushing him away with all her strength. The rigidity of her muscles managed to convey that impression. She would lie there with shut eyes, neither resisting nor cooperating, but submitting. It was extraordinarily embarrassing, and after a while, horrible. But even then, he could have borne living with her if he, it had been agreed that they should remain celibate. But curiously enough, it was Catherine who refused this. She must, she said, produce a child if they could. So the performance continued to happen once a week quite regularly whenever it was not impossible. She used even to remind him of it in the morning as something which had to be done that evening and which must not be forgotten. She had two names for it. One was making a baby and the other was our duty to the party. Yes, she had actually used that phrase. Quite soon, he grew to have a feeling of positive dread when the appointed day came around. But luckily, no child appeared, and in the end, she agreed to give up trying, and soon afterwards, they parted. Winston sighed inaudibly. He picked up his pen again and wrote, She threw herself down on the bed, and at once, without any kind of preliminary, in the most coarse, horrible way you can imagine, pulled up her skirt. I, he saw himself standing there in the dim lamplight, with the smell of bugs and cheap scent in his nostrils and in his heart, a feeling of defeat and resentment which even at that moment was mixed up with the thought of Catherine's white body, frozen forever by the hypnotic power of the party. Why did it always have to be like this? Why could he not have a woman of his own instead of these filthy scuffles at intervals of years? But a real love affair was un an almost unthinkable event. The women of the party were all alike, Chastity was as deeply ingrained in them as party loyalty. By careful early conditioning, by games and cold water, by the rubbish that was dimmed in, dinned into them at school and in the spies and the youth league, by lectures, parades, songs, slogans, and martial music, the natural feeling had been driven out of them. His reason told him that there must be exceptions, but his heart did not believe it. They were all impregnable, as the party intended that they should be. And what he wanted more even than to be loved was to break down that wall of virtue, even if it were only once in his whole life. The sexual act successfully performed was rebellion. Desire was thought crime. Even to have awakened Catherine, if he could have achieved it, would have been like a seduction, although she was his wife. But the rest of the story had got to be written down. 
he wrote, I turned up the lamp when I saw her in the light. After the darkness, the feeble light of the paraffin lamp had seemed very bright. <clears throat> For the first time, he could see the woman properly. <clears throat> he had taken a step toward her and then halted, full of lust and terror. He was painfully conscious of the risk he had taken in coming here. It was perfectly possible that the patrols would catch him on the way out, for they, for that matter, they might be waiting outside the door at this moment. If he went away without even doing what he had come here to do, it had got to be written down, it had got to be confessed. What he had suddenly seen in the lamplight was that the woman was old. The paint was plastered so thick on her face that it looked as though it might crack like a cardboard mask. There were streaks of white in her hair, but the truly dreadful detail was that her mouth had fallen a little open, revealing nothing except a cavernous blackness. She had no teeth at all, he wrote hurriedly in scrabbling handwriting. When I saw her in the light, she was quite an old woman, fifty years old at least, but I went ahead and did it just the same. He pressed his fingers against his eyelids again. He had written it down at last, but it made no difference. The therapy had not worked. The urge to shout filthy words at the top of his voice was as strong as ever. <clears throat> okay, so that's the end of chapter 6. By the time I finish chapter 7, I probably won't have any voice. I'll, I won't talk for the rest of the night. It's twice as long as 6. Take a quick break for a second. Do you need to say something? <laughs> oh, okay. you're, you're both dying to talk. Or... No, I, I want Donna to make me some food. I, I saw the sign language gonna... signal with the... If you didn't understand... Yeah, he wants you to make him food, is what he wants. I asked her to do it like 20 minutes ago, and she made herself food. Yeah, she made fried eggs. Oh. And then she comes over here and yells at me that her phone fell because of her, most likely. Yeah. Like, between the couch, and she yells at me and tries to hit me. Yeah, the couch was literally vibrating. It was not... It wasn't the phone. It was like the, the two cushions were vibrating every time yeah, somebody called her. <clears throat> so if you're gonna have still, to buy some lozenges when for these videos, yeah. So those who are still watching, if you're wondering what I'm doing, I'm doing Oak Area Farm, farming of heart, heart, malt uh, harmonies and uh, ore to make the sky gong, which at this date is on uh, 10 9 2018. And then more graphics selling for over 100k on more servers. And it takes 30 days to make. And um, the other things that you can use that make this guy go that you use for your mats and gallery sell for a lot of money. And I'm, tra I'm trying to make a bunch of money right now. And that's what my goal of what I'm doing in the game right now for um, your pleasure to watch me do. And another reason why I'm choosing to do the videos like this is because for religious videos, I'm going to read the Book of Mormon and the Bible. These videos have lots of reviews, lots of views. So maybe this will give me some more views for me down on YouTube for the, um, doing stuff like this. Don't you want to say anything? Um, yeah, let me see if I can find it. And I mentioned in the middle of the Let's all go to the to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby. My father's gonna go great grace in driving love is No we don't feel like you know how No, no, it's on it's on the thing. No, don't do that. What church thing. Don't do that. Don't do that. Whatever. I was seeing it the lobby on a moon day. Oh, I didn't know. Let's go to <laughs> the, the lobby. lobby. Come on now. Let's go to the lobby. 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 let us Roman numeral 7, is twice as long. Let's knock out these 12 pages. If there is hope, wrote Winston, it lies in the proles. If there was hope, it must lie in the proles, because only there, in those swarming, disregarded masses, 
85% of the population of Oceania could the force to destroy the party ever be generated. The party could not be overthrown from within. Its enemies, if it had any enemies, had no way of coming together or even of identifying one another. Even if the legendary Brotherhood existed, as just possibly it might, it was inconceivable that its members could ever assemble in larger numbers than twos and threes. Rebellion meant a look in the eyes, an inflection of the voice, at the most an occasional whispered word. But the proles, if only they could somehow become conscious of their own strength, would have no need to conspire. They needed only to rise up and shake themselves like a horse shaking off flies. If they chose, they could blow the party to pieces tomorrow morning. Surely sooner or later it must occur to them to do it. And yet, he remembered how once he had been walking down a crowded street when a tremendous shout of hundreds of voices, women's voices, had burst from a side street a little way ahead. It was a great formidable cry of anger and despair, a deep loud O, oh, and that went humming on like the reverberation of a bell. His heart had leapt. It started, he had thought, a riot. The proles were breaking loose at last. When he had reached the spot, it was to see a mob of two or three hundred women crowding around the stalls of a street market with faces as tragic as though they had been the doomed passengers on a sinking ship. But at this moment, the general despair broke down into a multitude of individual quarrels. It appeared that one of the stalls had been selling tin saucepans. They were wretched, flimsy things, but cooking pots of any kind were always difficult to get. Now the supply had unexpectedly given out. The successful women, bumped and jostled by the rest, were trying to make off with their saucepans while dozens of others clambered around the stall, accusing the stallkeeper of favoritism and of having more saucepans somewhere in reserve. There was a fresh outburst of yells. Two bloated women, one of them with her hair coming down, had got hold of the same saucepan and were trying to tear it out of one another's hands. For a moment they were both tugging and then the handle came off. Winston watched them disgustedly, and yet, just for a moment, what almost frightening power had sounded in that cry from only a few hundred throats. Why was it that they could never shout like that about anything that mattered? Until they became, become conscious, they will never rebel, and until, they have, until after they have rebelled, they cannot become conscious. That, he reflected, might also, almost have been a transcription from one of the party textbooks. The party claimed, of course, to have liberated the proles from bondage. Before the, liber the revolution, they had hide hideously been oppressed by the capitalists. They had been starved and flogged. Women had been forced to work in the coal mines. Women still did work in the coal mines, as a matter of fact. Children had been sold into the factories at the age of six. But simultaneously, true to the principle of double, double think, the party taught that the proles were natural inferiors who must be kept in subjection like animals by the application of a few simple rules. In reality, very little was known about the proles. It was not necessary to know much. So long as they continued to work and breed, their other activities were without importance. Left to themselves like cattle turned loose upon the plains of Argentina, they had re reverted to a style of life that appeared to be natural to them, a sort of ancestral pattern. They were born, they grew up in the gutters, they went to work at twelve, they passed through a brief blossoming period of beauty and sexual desire, they married at twenty, they were middle-aged at thirty, they died for the most part at sixty. Heavy physical work, the care of home and children, petty quarrels with neighbors, films, football, beer, and above all, gambling filled up the horizon of their minds. To keep them in control was not difficult. A few agents of the Thought Police moved always among them, spreading false rumors and marking down and eliminating the few individuals who were judged capable of becoming dangerous, but no attempt was made to indoctrinate them with the ideology of the party. It was not desirable that the proles should have strong political feelings. All that was required of them was a primitive patriotism which could be appealed to whenever it was necessary to make them accept longer working hours or shorter rations. And even when they became discontented, as they sometimes did, their discontent led nowhere because being without general ideas, they could only focus it on petty specific grievances. The larger evils invariably escaped their notice. The great majority of proles did not even have telescreens in their homes. Even the civil police interfered with them very little. There was a vast amount of criminality in London, a whole world within a world, 
of thieves, bandits, prostitutes, drug peddlers, and racketeers of every description. But since it all happened among the proles themselves, it was of no importance. <clears throat> In all questions of morals, they were allowed to follow their ancestral code. The sexual puritanism of the party was not imposed upon them. Promiscuity went unpunished. Divorce was permitted. For that matter, even religious worship would have been permitted if the proles had shown any sign of needing it or wanting it. They were beneath suspicion. <clears throat> As the party slogan put it, proles and animals are free. Winston reached down and cautiously scratched his varicose ulcer. It had begun itching again. The thing you invariably came back to was the impossibility of knowing what life before the revolution had really been like. He took out of the drawer a copy of a children's history textbook which he had borrowed from Mrs. Parsons and began copying a passage into the diary. In the old days it ran, before the glorious revolution, London was not the beautiful city that we know today. It was a dark, dirty, miserable place where hardly anybody had enough to eat and where hundreds and thousands had enough... Uh, hundreds and thousands of poor people had no boots on their feet and not even a roof to sleep under. Children no older than you are had to work 12 hours a day for cruel mobsters, masters, who flogged them with whips if they worked too slowly and fed them on nothing but stale bread crusts and water. But in among all this terrible poverty, there was just a few great, big, beautiful houses that were lived in by rich men who had as many as 30 servants to look after them. These rich men were called capitalists. They were fat, ugly men. <sighs> Must be a boring chapter if I'm yawning. Mm -hmm. They were fat, ugly men with wicked faces, like the one in the picture on the opposite page. You can see that he is dressed in a long black coat, which was called a frock coat, and a queer shiny hat shaped like a stovepipe, which was called a top hat. This was the uniform of the capitalists, and no one else was allowed to wear it. The capitalists owned everything in the world, and everyone else was their slave. They owned all the land, all the houses, all the factories, and all the money. If anyone disobeyed them, they could throw him into prison, or they could take his job away and starve him to death. When any ordinary person spoke to a capitalist, he had to cringe and bow to him and take off his cap and address him as Sir. The chief of all the capitalists was called the King, and... But he knew the rest of the catalog. There would be mention of the bishops in their lawn sleeves, the judges in their ermine robes, the pillory, the stocks, the treadmill, the cat o' nine tails, the Lord Mayor's banquet, and the practice of kissing the Pope's toe. There was also something called the Jews Prame Noctis, which would probably not be mentioned in a textbook for children. It was the law by which every capitalist had the right to sleep with any woman working in one of his factories. We are both shaking our heads from side to side. Okay, how could you tell how much of it was lies? It might be true that the average human being was better off now than he had ever been before the revolution. The only evidence to the contrary was the mute protest in your own bones, the instinctive feeling that the conditions you lived in were intolerable, and that at some other time they must have been different. It struck him that the truly characteristic thing about modern life was not its cruelty and insecurity, but simply its bareness, its dinginess, its listlessness. Life, if you looked about you, bore no resemblance not only to the lies that streamed out of the telescreens, but even to the ideals that the party was trying to achieve. Great areas of it, even for a party member, were neutral and non-political, a matter of slogging through dreary jobs, fighting for a place on the tube, darning out a worn-out sock, cadging a saccharine tablet, <clears throat> saving a cigarette end, the ideal set up by the party was something huge, terrible, and glittering, a world of steel and concrete, of monstrous machines and terrifying weapons, a nation of warriors and fanatics marching forward in perfect unity, all thinking the same thoughts and shouting the same slogans, perpetually working, fighting, triumphing, persecuting, 300 million people all with the same face. The reality was decaying, dingy cities where underfed people shuffled to and fro in leaky shoes, and in patched up 19th century houses that smelt always of cabbage and bad lavatories. He seemed to see a vision of London, vast and ruinous, city of a million dustbins, and mixed up with it was a picture of Mrs. Parsons, a woman with lined face and wispy hair, fidd fiddling helplessly with a blocked waste pipe. He reached down and scratched his ankle again. 
Day and night, the telescreens bruised your ears with statistics proving that people today had more food, more clothes, better houses, better recreation, that they lived longer, worked shorter hours, were bigger, healthier, stronger, happier, more intelligent, better educated than the people of 50 years ago. Not a word of it could ever be proved or disproved. The party claimed, for example, that 40 today that today 40% of adult proles were literate. Before the le the revolution, it was said the number had only been 15%. The party claimed that the infant mortality rate was now only 160 per thousand, whereas before the revolution it had been 300, and so it went on. It was like a single equation with two unknowns. It might very well be that that literally. Every word in history books, even the things that one accepted without question, was pure fantasy. For all he knew, there might never have been such a law as the Jus Primae prime Noctis, or any such creature as a capitalist, or any such garment as a top hat. Everything faded into mist. The past was erased, the erasure was forgotten, the lie became truth. Just once in his life he had possessed, after the event, that was, that was what counted concrete, unmistakable evidence of an act of falsification. He had held it between his fingers for as long as 30 seconds. In 1973, it must have been, at any rate, it was about, at about the same time when he and Catherine had parted. But the really relevant date was seven or eight years earlier. The story really began in the middle 60s, the period of the Great Purges in which the original leaders of the revolution were wiped out once and for all. By 1970, none of them was left except Big Brother himself. All the rest had by that time been exposed as traitors and counter-revolutionaries. Goldstein had fled and, hi and was hiding, no one knew where, and of the others, a few had simply disappeared while the majority had been executed after spectacular public trials at which they made confession of their crimes. Among the last survivors were three men named Jones, Aronson, and Rutherford. It must have been in 1965 that these three had been arrested. As often happened, they had vanished for a year or more so that one did not know whether they were dead or alive, and then had suddenly been brought forth to in incriminate themselves in the usual way. They had confessed to intelligence with the, the enemy, at that date too, the enemy was Eurasia, embezzlement of public funds, <clears throat> the murder of various trusted party members, intrigues against the leadership of Big Brother which had started long before the revolution happened, and acts of sabotage causing the deaths of hundreds of thousands of people. After confessing to these things, they had been pardoned, reinstated in the party, and given posts which were in fact sinecures, but which sounded important. All three had written long, abject articles in the Times, analyzing the reasons for their defection and promising to make amends. Sometime after their release, Winston had actually seen all three of them in the Chestnut Tree Cafe. He remembered the sort of terrified fascination with which he had watched them out of the corner of his eye. They were men far older than himself, himself relics of the ancient world, almost the last great figures left over from the heroic early days of the party. <clears throat> The glamour of the underground struggle and the Civil War still faintly clung to them. He had the feeling, though already at that time facts and dates were growing blurry, that he had known their names earlier than that he had known that of Big Brother. But also, they were outlaws, enemies, untouchables, doomed with absolute certainty to extinction within a year or two. No one who had once fallen into the hands of the thought police ever escaped in the end. They were corpses waiting to be sent back to the grave. There was no one at any of the tables nearest to them. It was not wise even to be seen in the neighborhood of such people. They were sitting in silence before glasses of the gin flavored with cloves, which was the specialty of the cafe. Of the three, it was Rutherford whose appearance had most impressed Winston. Rutherford had once been a famous caricaturist, whose brutal cartoons had helped to inflame popular opinion before and during the revolution. Even now, at long intervals, his cartoons were appearing in the Times. They were simply an imitation of his earlier manner and curiously lifeless and unconvincing. Always they were a rehashing of the ancient themes, slum tenements, starving children, street battles, capitalists in top hats. Even on the barricades, the capitalists seemed to cling to their top hats, an endless, hopeless effort to get back into the past. 
He was a monstrous man with a mane of greasy gray hair, his face pouched and seamed with protuberant lips. At one time he must have been immensely strong. Now his great body was sagging, sloping, bulging, falling away in every direction. He seemed to be breaking up before one's eyes like a mountain crumbling. It was the lonely hour of fifteen. Winston could not now remember how he had come to be in the cafe at such a time. The place was almost empty. A tinny music was trickling from the telescreens. The three men sat in their corner almost motionless, never speaking. Uncommanded, the waiter brought fresh glasses of gin. There was a chessboard on the table beside them with the pieces set out, but no game started. And then, for perhaps half a minute in all, something happened to the telescreens. The tune that they were playing changed, and the tone of the music changed too. There came into it, but it was something hard to describe. It was a peculiar, cracked, braying, jeering note. In his mind, Winston called it a yellow note. And then a voice from the telescreen was singing, Under the spreading chestnut tree, I sold you and you sold me. There lie they, and here lie we, under the spreading chestnut tree. The three men never stirred, but when Winston glanced again at Rutherford's ruinous face, he saw that his eyes were full of tears. And for the first time he noticed, with a kind of inward shudder, and yet not knowing at what he shuddered, that both Aronson and Rutherford had broken noses. A little later, all three were rearrested. It appeared that they had engaged in fresh conspiracies from the very moment of their release. At their second trial, they confessed to all their old crimes over again with a whole string of new ones. They were executed, and their fate was recorded in the party histories, a warning to posterity. About five years after this, in 1973, Winston was unrolling a wad of documents which had just flopped out of the pneumatic tube onto his desk when he came on a fragment of paper which had evidently been slipped in among the others and then forgotten. The instant he had flattened it out, he saw its significance. It was a half page torn out of the times of about ten years earlier, the top half of the page so that it included the date, and it contained a photograph of the delegates at some party function in New York. Prominent in the middle of the group were Jones, Aronson, and Rutherford. There was no mistaking them. In any case, their names were in the caption at the bottom. The point was that at both trials, all three men had confessed that on the date they had been, been on Eurasian soil. They had flown from a secret airfield in Canada to a rendezvous somewhere in Siberia and had conferred with members of the Eurasian general staff to whom they had betrayed important military secrets. The date had stuck in Winston's memory because it chanced to be Midsummer Day, but the whole story must be on record in countless other places as well. There was only one possible conclusion. The confessions were lies. Of course, this was not in itself a discovery. Even at the time, Winston had not imagined that the people who were wiped out in the purges had actually committed the crimes that they were accused of. But this was concrete evidence. It was a fragment of the abolished past, like a fossil bone which turns up in the wrong stratum and destroys a geological theory. It was enough to blow the party to atoms if in some way it could have been published to the world and its significance made known. He had gone straight on working, and soon as he saw what that photograph was and what it meant, he had covered it up with another sheet of paper. Luckily, when he unrolled it, it had been upside down from the point of view of the telescreen. He took his scribbling pad on his knee and pushed back his chair so as to get as far away from the telescreen as possible. To keep your face expressionless was not difficult, and even your breathing could be controlled with an effort. But you could not control the beating of your heart, and the telescreen was quite delicate enough to pick it up. He let what he judged to be ten minutes go by, tormented all the while by the fear that some accident a sudden draught, draft blowing across his desk, for instance, would betray him. Then, without uncovering it again, he dropped the photograph into the memory hole, along with some other waste papers. <clears throat> Within another minute, perhaps, it would have crumbled into ashes. <clears throat> That's the first time I've ever said memory hole and didn't laugh. Mm -hmm. That was 10, 11 years ago. Today, probably, he would have kept that photograph. It was curious that the fact of having it held in his fingers seemed to him to make a difference even now, when the photograph itself, as well as the event it recorded, was only memory. 
Was the party's hold upon the past less strong, he wondered, because a piece of evidence which existed no longer had once existed? But today, supposing that it could be somehow resurrected from its ashes, the photograph might not even be evidence. Already at the time when he made his discovery, Oceania was no longer at war with Eurasia, and it must have been to the agents of Eurasia that the three dead men had betrayed their country. Since then, there had been many other changes, two, three, he could not remember how many. Very likely, the confessions had been rewritten and rewritten until the original facts and dates no longer had the smallest significance. The past not only changed, but changed continuously. What most afflicted him with the sense of nightmare was the, that he had never clearly understood why the huge imposture was undertaken. The immediate advantages of falsifying the past were obvious, but the ultimate motive was mysterious. He took up his pen again and wrote, I understand how, I do not understand why. He wondered, as he had many times wondered before, whether he himself was a lunatic. Perhaps a lunatic was simply a minority of one. At one time it had been a sign of madness to believe that the earth goes around the sun. Today, to believe that the past is unalterable. He might be alone in holding that belief, and if alone, then a lunatic. But the thought of being a lunatic did not greatly trouble him. The horror was that he might also be wrong. He picked up the children's history book, looked at the portrait of Big Brother, which formed its frontispiece. The hypnotic eyes gazed into his own. Doug is the only person awake listening to this in this condo. Oh, is it getting hard to read right it, now? Uh, it, I'm almost done. No, is it getting hard, like, is it hard to understand what you're reading? No. You're pausing a lot. Is, this, is it your voice calling? It's just the voice. Yeah. Oh, okay. It was as though... Can it yeah. Can it to the can? You can't get to the can. <laughs> Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby. Let's all go to the lobby. And get some candy and popcorn and soda. <laughs> well, see, Doug is a better song lyricist than whoever 50s dumb person wrote that. <laughs> it was as though some huge force were pressing down upon you, something that penetrated inside your skull, battering against your brain, frightening you out of your beliefs, persuading you almost to deny the evidence of your senses. In the end, the party would announce that two and two made five, and you would have to believe it. It was inevitable that they should make that claim sooner or later. The logic of their position demanded it. Not merely the validity of experience, but the very existence of eternal reality was tacitly denied by their philosophy. The hearsay of hearsay, hearsay of hearsays was common sense, and what was terrifying was not that they would kill you for thinking otherwise, but that they might be right. For after all, how do we know that two and two make four? Yeah, exactly. Or, <laughs> or that the force of gravity works. See, I'm floating right now. You can't <laughs> see it because we're not filming. Or that the past is unchangeable. If both the past and the external world exist only in the mind, and if the mind itself is controllable, what then? But no. It, it literally says, but no, with an exclamation point. <laughs> His courage seemed suddenly to stiffen of its own accord. The face of O'Brien, not called up by any obvious association, had floated into his mind. He knew with more certainty than before that O'Brien was on his side. He was writing the diary for O'Brien to O'Brien, it was like an interminable letter, which no one would ever read, but which was addressed to a particular person and took its color from that fact. I got a question. The, yeah. Two or four or both? Both. Okay. Yeah. This guy's insane. Yeah, it goes four O'Brien hyphen, the two in italics, O'Brien. Some yeah, nuts. <laughs> yeah. The party told you to reject the evidence of your eyes and ears. It was their final, most essential command. His heart sank as he thought of the enormous power arrayed against him, the ease with which any party intellectual would overthrow him in debate, the subtle arguments which he would not be able to understand, much less anger answer. And yet he was in the right. They were wrong and he was right. The obvious, the silly, and the true had got to be defended. Truisms are true. Hold on to that. The solid world exists. Its laws do not change. Stones are hard. Water is wet. Objects unsupported fall towards the Earth's center. With the feeling that he was speaking to O'Brien, and all, also that he was setting forth an important axiom, he wrote, Freedom is the freedom to say that 2 plus 2 make 4. If that is granted, all else follows. 
That's the end of chapter 7 on page 81. George Orwell uses a thesaurus too much, I think. I think he go whenever he has a difficult word, then he goes and writes down every single synonym that's in his thesaurus. Just to make the book even longer, I think. <laughs> so that one wasn't nearly as funny as chapter 5. Yeah. Oh, I was listening to our playlist. Yeah. And during our playlist, when I was thinking about that, <laughs> I feel like I was listening to sometimes. Um, some guy was reading the whole book. Some guy was reading? Yeah, the whole book. And he did an hour and ten minutes for the first three, the first third of the mm. book he read. An hour. So that's a lot of reading. Probably has a gallon of tea right near you, know, like hot tea or hot chicken soup. Or mm -hmm. Anything else you want to say for our outfits? Um, any events going on or anything? Any events? Is there? Um, I'm checking out a new Thai restaurant uh, in Mira Mesa yeah. on Thursday. Hopefully it'll be good. Can't eat anything with basil though, so I'm going to read that uh, menu pretty carefully. You want to say anything about the church? Sure. Um, church is um, <clears throat> in January next year, shortening the two hours. The reason being that if you have a family, you're supposed to go home and hang out with your family and reflect upon what you just learned in church. How's that going to deal with single people? I don't understand. That part I don't get. So I guess it'll encourage single people to hang out more afterwards. Maybe there will be a family home evening every Sunday during that one hour time that they were in church. Or we'll have, the choirs will get a lot better because they'll have more practice time. Oh. So single word choirs will probably be the best singers <laughs> in the church next year. Are you done? And um, if you're out there watching this, that fool that tried to befriend me and shake my hand at the Pacific Beach uh, Singles Ward, uh, the reason I don't like you, you simpleton, is because you went to high school with my ex fiance and then you lied about it. When I asked you if you dated her, you lied about it. Simple as that. And I don't like your mom either, because your mom was behind it. Figure it out. Use what little brain cells you have. Figure out that I don't want to be your friend. Ooh. Snap. <laughs> oh, burn. You better be watching it too and leave a comment too. <laughs> All right, let's start one more thing before we stop it. Cracker, cracker, peanut butter, cracker, cracker, peanut butter. Now you have watched the movie. It's time to get the out of here. <laughs> Go back home to your family and leave the show right now. Thank you for watching. Bye. This has been a Doug production. And a JJ production. Awesome, Lego.